<laughs> Robbie arrests? And I you decided like, to record that? I was just like, oh my god. I was like watching the Bake Off. Anyway, this is recording now. <laughs> <laughs> I've been watching Great Robert British Bake Off. I've been watching the Great British Bake Off very closely right now, man. Um, anyway, <laughs> I've been a, a strong critic in bakes. Too, too overbaked. Anyway, um, uh, anyone who wants to, to take notes, please do so. Um, as if I talk, but I, I'll be taking notes when, when we're talking as well. Um, so, a um, couple of announcements before we start. He's going to be around. If he isn't, then, you know. Hey, Tad. Hey, Tino. What up, what up, what up? Hey, guys. So, we are... So we'll start with some announcements next week. Um, I'll try, like, if everyone's okay with it, if we could move it to Monday at 7 or 6 p.m. Eastern, that would be really nice, or 7 p.m. Eastern. <coughs> um, but I I'll try to, to push it out tomorrow and, and ask for change in the time. Um, but for this last week, I just wanted to announce two things, three things. First is, um, Progressive Hack Night got 40, for, like 40 people in, the, in this week's Hack Night. Um, it was amazing. Um, we are, like, I'm going to propose something for, for as we move forward because I think um, ThoughtWorks has a plan of us uh, occupying the whole floor. So right now, we're just occupying a, a, a majority of the, of the space. But the, the whole space can, can contain like 200 people. And I think the, the growth that we're seeing right now, if it continues, we might be occupying the whole space. So we're going to have a, a huge meeting this week. Um, also, uh, this week, uh, I think the Democracy Alliance will have a, a, a conference. And I'm slated to talk there. I think last week we were able to vote on me going there. Um, Democracy Alliance is a huge network of progressive funders. Um, move on, uh, new media ventures are there and all that, all the people there. And um, uh, we're slated on the technology caucus. Um, what's amazing about this is that we're going to ask, uh, I, I'm talking to, to Josh from CodeCore and, um, and uh, who's this? Josh from Code Core and and Kipchoge from Take Two. So Take Two is is on the second round right now, funding for new media ventures, and I think a signal boost from us would really help in terms of pushing them towards that that goalpost for them to be funded. So um, we are utilizing the network we have at the moment to to really focus on and, and provide support to these applications. Um, so I have been yesterday and for this week, Jacob has been in New York. Jacob, do you want to talk about it? Hey, uh, you go ahead and you go ahead and talk, and I'll fill okay, in so, if you want. Um, we have been strategizing a lot. Um, I think it would be best if Jacob could, you could set time sometime to like present for like if if that strategy is clear, if you want to share that strategy as well. Um, it's been very, very productive. Um, uh, there's a lot happening, and um, uh, we're we're thinking of of setting up a retreat for progressive coders. And I'm still mulling over the idea, or I'm going to talk to folks from the People Summit if we could have like a bulk or a, a discount for progressive coders, folks, and we could fundraise for people going to that summit. So that we could have a nexus. First nexus point would be with with the progressives, and like, um, the next second retreat would be somewhere with Jacob in North Carolina, or somewhere where we could really start talking to on the ground folks as well as as well as creating unconferences for us. So Jacob, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I was thinking about the retreat thing a little bit, and. Uh... I think there would also be a lot of support just for hosting a conference um, and having part of that be getting app creators together. Um, so uh, that's something I'd be interested in exploring too. Okay. 
but there's definitely a lot of value i think in just getting people together in the same room and being having time to hash out things sounds good um anyone wants to add any more announcement before we go to to the vote a lot of value no okay so i think um we're going to start with those who which we did not discuss last week so joe has greened it all up thank you joe um so we'll just go for joe channel cleanup um we'll try to go as fast as we can because i would love to continue my rest <laughs> everyone is in the very sunday mode today it's a nice day in new york so um joe um go for it with the channel cleanup yeah so this one again it's not a uh, not asking for consent yet i'm asking this consent to proceed um, just basically for, for the channels that we own, uh, operational and other community channels, really standardizing the information that is, uh, that is included in there. Um, so that just makes it very easy for people to get involved. Probably just say, here's a document for the goals and strategy. Here's a link over to the GitHub, whatever it may be. Um, we'd love to just use operations as a test bed for this. So cleaning up those channels. Um, and then through that, I'll come back with a proposal for what this actually looks like, what the template would look like for these other channels, and what the rollout plan would look like for this as well. Um, and and so then, and that is a that's and then updating the wiki, of course. So it's more on um, building or continuing on on standardizing channel information for uh, for operations or for progressive for prog code um, channels. And provide best practice for others exactly yep okay anyone has comments on that jacob uh is part of that potentially like thinking about the at channel mentions and a system for dealing with that uh it wasn't specifically in scope but it is definitely something that is a um is a challenge and, and something that we should consider. I know Tad, we, we've sort of talked a little bit about uh, ways that we can potentially augment the Slack bot or using Prog bot or, or whatever. I don't know, Tad, if you have anything to, uh, to add to that there. It's probably something that's worth a uh, concerted effort around because we've talked about it a good bit, but um, we haven't had a specific focus on it yet. Yeah, it would actually be really easy to set something up with Zapier uh, to create a bot that like mentions people for you or mentions channel for you uh, when you call it. Yeah, and I think Tad, had, and Tad, if you want to jump in, I believe that you had mentioned something along those lines. Yeah, there's basically two pieces. Piece one is just disabling people's ability to mention at channel. And then step two would be giving them a workaround like you're suggesting with Zapier. And it's also instant in public channels because the Slack integration with Zapier uses webhooks. What is, how, how do you use that? Um, I actually set up a Zap to test it out. Um, and it was like, basically you can create it in two steps. Uh, you listen for a mention of a specific user or like keyword uh, in the Zapier trigger. And then the action is that you like mention the channel and you can like add some other text too if you want in the bot. Um, but, and then we could also have a intermediary step with an if condition for like uh, to check if you can't check with Zapier the size of the channel, but we could maintain a spreadsheet or something for blacklisted channels based on size externally, and then check and see if that uh, channel is okay to mention in. But even just having a bot with a specific keyword that you had to use would be enough to keep uh, brand new members from immediately at channeling without like realizing what the issue with that might be. Um, anyone else? Uh, just I'd be fully supportive of it, and maybe Jacob, if you want to write up a uh, GitHub issue and whatever the plan would be to roll that out and get that uh, approved next week, I think that would be a, a huge, huge benefit. 
Which issue, uh, which repo would that go on? That would go, and I'll drop a link. Okay, thanks. Um, for me, my only concern is that if we start regulating um, the ad channel without, like, uh, I, 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 I'd say we should be very careful in that because I feel that, I don't know, there's like this stress about calling out people who are using continuously the, the ad channel for public. But then there's this strong power for folks to, or it's very empowering for people to use ad channel in their own channels, right? So I feel like it's it's a trigger, like a mechanism for us to provide ownership on their channel as well. And once we encroach that with setting up these policies or blocking them, they'll use for it. Like it, it sets a uh, culture. I, 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 I'm still very wary of that on my end. Yeah, the the point of the bot would be to still enable that functionality in inside smaller channels, but for like it just basically lets us it would be nice if Slack had more custom permissioning for ad channel mentions, but yeah. Doesn't. So it's just filling that out for for us. Okay, so this bot would would enable it for other channels, but for bigger channels it would it would keep it up. Yeah, or or we could just have it um, enabled everywhere, and it would just be a different keyword than at channel that you would have to have a bit more understanding of, like, have been in the community long enough to see it used, and uh, basically, you just if you're using it, then you've been onboarded a little bit more than just being a Slack user. Okay. Um, anything else, anyone, Joe? Okay. okay, so anyone who wants to consent on this to proceed, please press in plus one. I'm all for a bot if it will um, reduce our ability, our necessity of having to police the channels because I hate being the channel cop. <laughs> Amen. I, I hate it too. <laughs> Do we call the bot channel cop? <laughs> works for me. <laughs> Um, Joe, uh, so, okay, um, Stephen, Tino, you know, Dad, how about you? Yeah. Okay, um, will you be a blessing one here or would you like me to, to go for it? I'm, I'm looking for the document. Okay. It's a uh, link over, drop it, drop it in at 7-Eleven. Here. Oh, I see. Okay, so um, Joe, do you want to talk about create standard GitHub change template? Yep, so I think for these GitHub issues, it would be pretty valuable if we had some standard uh, standard elements that we were putting into the issues. Um, and Rob, you and I talked a little bit back and forth about potentially modifying these fields, but I think just having a template that people can use and making sure we're capturing key information. So description, just a high level overview, what problem the issue actually addresses, uh, the benefit for doing so, and then having the actual implementation plan for, um, for what this is. Um, it's kind of like this for, for projects, we created this issue template. Uh, so this one's the issue template and if, if ever you, um, name anything like that, it will, whenever you create an issue, it provides you with the template automatically. So um, it's something that, that you're, you want to, to do, right? This is something along with that. Yeah, same sort of thing. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to love to have open up some conversation just in the issue on what fields are actually useful, what is a way to simplify it further before we, we don't need to consent on these exact fields yet, but just wanted to go that route. Okay. Um, what, first question is, what does network and volunteer staffers mean? Like, is this the one that's going to be affected by it? I don't know. I didn't have those. So who added these? Do you mind anyone? I wonder if Dave did in testing out the... Oh, um, yeah, it's Dave. Okay. I'm going to change the color because like, um, I, ch I had the color of like type of vote by the same color as it. So, okay. Um, I'm going to stack. Uh, what I said is, the, so this is the, 
the format you're using right now, right? Uh -huh. um, for me, it's simpler, I think. Um, it's description who's effective in planned vote. So it's much more on providing easy access, but um, I, I think you're leading this one, so I, I, I'll defer to you. Yeah, I, I'd be, and I'd love to hear other people, I'd be totally fine consolidating the problem benefit and description all into just the description field. I think having the plan, the implementation plan and detailing out the steps that people are actually going through is pretty important because otherwise it can remain pretty nebulous. And some items, the plan doesn't be very much, but I think making sure that we are being thoughtful about what the next steps are, what we're actually, how we're going to, you know, um, socialize it, how we're going to go about implementing it is an important thing. Necessity. Okay. Anyone wants to comment? Um, Jacob. Uh, plus one for using headers though. I like, I think that makes it a little bit more readable. And um, also we can, uh, Markdown supports comments so that we can we can have instructions in line in the issue template. Something to keep in mind. Say that again, last one. Uh, Markdown supports comments, so we are able to put some instructions in line in the issue template. Yes, and uh, what you're exposing there is my ignorance to uh, GitHub in general. That's a great one, and the the template that Robbie had set up is definitely a better one. So I can uh, go and modify and put together the proposed. I think it would be awesome if we could have like a markdown session. Um, Pina. I think uh, it'd be beneficial to have description and problems separate, even though it's being discussed to combine them together. Often someone's just looking for the problem, they already understand the description as is. Uh, just having it separate just makes it so much easier. Okay. Okay, anyone else? Tamara, do you want to say more to that? I just uh, um, stacked and said I agree with Tino. I like having the problem and the description separated out because it forces the person to, and, and I mean myself, to think out, you know, okay, what is the problem? What is, um, you know, what's, what are we trying to fix? Okay. Sounds good. Um, thank you. And... Joe, this is to, to consent to change the, to prove, to create template, right? Yeah. Okay. And so, I'll still put out the final what this is before it's official. Okay. So this is how issue template is for um, Jacob just posted this and this is how um, issue template for layers for the browser at the moment. Yeah, and if you go to create an issue, you can see the uh, comments in line. Awesome. Issue, create new issue. Oh, there you go. There are comments here. Sounds good. Okay. Um, I'm going to post this here. There you go. Thank you. Um, let's do that vote. Thank you, anyone. Oh, someone's stacking maybe. Okay. Stephen, Pamela. Dad, are you still here? Okay. Thank you. Okay, awesome. And lastly, review, gather feedback, and update onboarding process. Joe, it's still you. Hmm. I thought this was linked to an issue. I guess not. Um, I forget the specific details of this one, so I'll need to go back and review. So we can okay. skip this one now. Okay. I'll skip this one. Skip. Dave, new team's board. He's not here. Well, I said I, I, I said Dave. Uh, that I offered that I could uh, run through it with people. Sure. Um, go for it. So yeah, if you don't mind uh, pulling up that. Oh yeah, cool. Um, so uh, basically, Dave had been working on ran through with us. Um, a proposed way of organizing the GitHub issues um, in a more left to right flow. Um, currently, as we have it, all the issues, they exist in the, just the individual functional view, which makes it somewhat challenging for actually uh, 
actually like getting through the individual issues, seeing what's where in a very quick and easy glance. And so, yeah, he, he put together this, this proposed board and then there's a recording that I posted in the operations channel the other day that walks through it. Um, but basically we would have the functions would be um, listed by their individual label. We have where individual GitHub issues are in the process, so a very quick and easy way of, of looking at things and then um, also propose on having more specific objectives that are tied to the quarterly strategy that we have. Um, in general, I, I think we need to work out the deep, the specific details and stuff like the column names and um, some other things and, you know, the training for doing so. But overall, I'm, I'm definitely supportive of it. I think it's a, would be a, a good improvement to what we're doing. Um, we, we would still be able to have the issues would be able to be visible in multiple boards if needed. Um, although obviously the, the tagging thing that we, uh, in covered is, is definitely, um, something that we'll, we'll need to see how that's impacted. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, it could be a good improvement. Okay. Um, I'm stacking anyone who wants to comment as well, please stack. Um, my comment here is that we, I, I, I really like it. I think this makes more of a, like the process by which, which where everything is. Um, I think it can live side by side with the current board because it just divides the whole process in very much different logic, which I think for me, for most of us would see it, for anyone who's trying to onboard here, like this provides us with a good sense of, of which are what. And I think like, for example, our partners that move on really appreciated this perspective because they're saying that, okay, what's up with the strategic partnership or what's up with evangelism? what's happening in operations at the moment. So, so this provides them with a bird's eye view of what's happening. For those of us who are, um, who are at in terms of like, where are things now? I think this provides with a really good glimpse of, of how things are in terms of the process perspective. So I think they could both live side by side. Um, so if that's possible, if that's the case, then I'll, I'll give it a question. Yeah, I think that the tag is then to uh, that would, uh, maybe yeah, right now the language is if the board would replace the existing board. Um, ah. That's the issue. Like, that's the one thing that I have issues with. So, yeah, yeah, I'd be fine with them living side by side. We'd have to test it out and see how how effectively that works in reality. Um, one thing you did show the search, which can go through the issues by function, so you'd be able to. Um, look at them that way, but it's not as direct as uh, as what you mentioned. Yeah, because I think uh, I'm I I it fi I find it easy to to maintain pi pilot initiatives, and I feel that it's easy for us to maintain this one as well. So, uh, but someone would have like I would have stronger attachment to this one, but um, if someone has a stronger attachment to this one, they should be free. It just provides much more ways of engagement as well. Um, Spamila. I also like the new board suggestion. The only concern that I have or maybe suggestion kind of picks up on something we spoke about last week and that's um, tagging people into the conversation when a new issue is brought up involving that team. Or, or another member who would be impact by the, impacted by the issue. I think just it, not only is it a common courtesy, but it isn't following with our current change process and tagging people in, I think would help to build trust into the process. It's just an extra measure of trust to know that um, Something that you're working on, if, if there's going to be a change in it, you get a notification and, and have the ability to weigh in. Right. Um, anyone else? Dad? Yeah, I just wanted to say that on GitHub, we can make actual teams and then we can, for instance, at member engagement or at uh, philanthropy or at whatever to mention the people concerned with whatever. Uh, the, I, I don't know what the teams were on that board. I can't recall. But basically create a team for each column. Create a team. Sounds good. 
I think this is, I think we can create a team and I think, yeah. That way people can join the teams that they're concerned with and, and kind of opt into receiving mentions. Anytime you mention um, at operations or at uh, member engagement. And, and the teams don't necessarily have to be part of the prog code team, right? It can be someone outside as well. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but that's okay. Good. Okay. Anyone else? Jacob. I was just going to say uh, that would be kind of nice. It's, Slack has a feature where you can uh, create groups, like user groups that you can mention. Um, that would be really powerful in Slack for sure. That's a paid it's, feature. It's Slack. a paid feature, yeah. Okay, soon, soon. <laughs> paid feature in Slack. Okay, um, Stephen, you, you said something, but would you like to speak up? No, it's just uh, commenting on Waffle IO. That was it. Okay. Oh, uh, so Waffle, like, if uh, it uses GitHub issue tags to sort into columns, um, so it's also Kanban board, but uh, it's got the advantage over GitHub projects because you don't have to uh, go back to the project to manually update the positioning of the card. It's, it's just auto positioned based on the tag, um, which is kind of nice if you're worried about maintaining like more than one board at a time. Uh, you don't have to like the source of truth is the tag. Uh, if that changes, then the view changes as well. Okay. But it is nice having everything right there on the GitHub repo. Sounds good. Okay. Um, this one is a consent vote. What, what is this, Joe? Um, do you want anything else to add, Joe? Uh, no, nothing to add. And then, yeah, I think it, I guess it's consent to continue. Okay. Um, I'm going to add one here saying um, if it coexists with pilot initiatives. and Pamela. And it needs a new name. Yeah. Needs new one. Okay. Pamela, your turn. Create members tab for onboarding. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in our current project view for partner onboarding team or onboarding um, coordinators, there's a really nice list in our master error table of all of the team's needs, all of their current tech stack uses, platforms, languages, and what they anticipate needing in the future in terms of tech stack uh, skills, um, familiarity with certain languages and platforms to build in additional functionality. Um, when we have our member onboarding sessions, there's no place to write down the information we get from those sessions so my initial ask was to include a members tab on the master air table so that we could when we we're doing one-on-one -on -one interviews we could fill that data out for each member and then um, I think the community would have to vote as to whether or not that's front-facing but at least if it could be if it could face staff and tell or unless the point the community decides to make it front facing it would help us in um, linking up volunteer members to projects seeking help um, since the original ask way back on february 14th a lot of new um, 
alternatives have been brought to me, like the potential to make a list from, Tad knows all of the details and so does Tino, but to, to not have to manually input for existing members, but it would, it would just, um, a lot of that data would be incorporated into the Airtable automatically. And I think Jacob also mentioned the possibility of a CRM to do that. So that would make it more um, valuable because then we wouldn't, it wouldn't just be for members who attend onboarding because that percentage I think is really low in comparison to the membership overall. Okay, um, I start. Um, one thing I think for, I have issues with it being front, like public facing uh, because of uh, privacy issues. But if, and then um, I think these are information that we could use to connect one project to another. So it's more work for us but it provides projects to have ownership over their their project and at the same time like provide us with a because i really believe how we should be um we should be uh continuously looking at uh looking at um what's this spaces and opportunities to create relationships and i feel that the act of the act of introducing member A to project leader B um, is, is one of those spaces that we could amplify relationship building, not only for us, but also for us and the projects and for us and the member. So um, that's my take on it. Um, Tina. Uh, just to be completely open and honest, uh, the web team is considering to build something uh, that is very similar to what Pamela's request is, uh, but on the website. So this way, the person can fill out their skill stacks um, and uh, anything else in terms of location. So this way, we know what is the best time to contact the PM and a user uh, or a developer to introduce themselves together. I started that conversation today with uh, uh, Tad, uh, the web team, uh, which was Julia, uh, Megan, Alex, uh, Ralphie and myself uh, met on uh, Friday and we discussed uh, different ways that we could uh, make that relationship stronger between the PMs and also the volunteers through uh, the website uh, solution. Okay. And Dino met in for solutions. Um, anything, anyone else? Um, Pamela, do you wanna, do you wanna comment back? Um, I would just say that I absolutely agree and second your uh, your observations about the one-on-one -on -one contact and, and would hope that this would not replace that um, because there's just a, I just really agree with everything you said I'll just say that I can't really elaborate more than that but if the vote is ever taken and made to make it uh, public facing I would I would echo those concerns that you mentioned Rafi Okay, thank you. The public. Okay, um, Joe. Oh, sorry, Jacob. Uh, do you know, have you guys looked at CRMs at all yet? Because um, like putting up a form to collect some metadata about users is certainly like a core feature of most any CRM. Um, we we definitely talked about that you're looking for a CRM and what we said was uh, or at least the discussion uh, went in this direction when Pamela or Stephen are using a CRM how confusing is this going to be being that uh, some of the things that we're looking to collect on users is so minimalistic uh, CRM might be outdoing uh, the need and also confusing the onboarding team uh, our focus was on the users and also the focus on the onboarding team make sure that the process was as simple and concise as possible. But we would love to talk about CRM, and I really would uh, love to touch up on uh, what solutions you have in mind. Yeah, uh, let's do that. So I think it might be easier to grow with if we start out with a CRM. Um, we can always export our data and put it in a custom system. Okay. Um, Joe? 
Yeah, and hopefully we'd be able to ideally um, just even link the different back ends and front ends together and have the CRM show up abstracted. Um, for this one specifically, um, is the Pamela question for you then, does it make sense to have the initial use case being, let's add this field in Airtable, have it link potentially into the website redesign stuff and then long term looking at how it pulls into a CRM? Um, Joe, I think I, I like that suggestion. I would even, if it's possible, like to start now with a manual, with a table that we can enter manually the way that we do the projects um, onboarding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yep. then and, uh, erase duplicates when we automate. Because it, I don't know how, it, I mean, we've been tossing this, Should seems like a really simple idea. And we've been tossing it around for going on five weeks and the creation of a CRM sounds to me like it's going to take a lot, lot longer. Um, so if we could at least start manually entering it, that would reduce my workload a lot and make me more effective as an app partner on border and a member on border. I think, oh, sorry, that, well, I was just going to say that we just finished building something for updating an Airtable with all of our channels with info from Slack. And I think it'd be trivial once we get the, the live token, it'd be trivial to do the same for a user's list. And uh, I mean, I think that we could get it in a couple of days for Pamela. That is amazing. Um, do something for the members. <laughs> Also, bad drops. Um, me, I, I just wanted to echo what Tad is saying. Like, I think in terms of creating a form, there is a trivial way to go about that. I think you have already. Um, like, what are the fields that you want added? Because I think it can be linked to what we have right now. Um, like, with the, with the volunteer list that we have, we can just link into a form for it to feed on different columns as well. So if that's possible, like I would love to talk to you about it as well. But I think that already has this covered. So um, let me know how it goes, but um, I would also love to help out if you need it. Uh, Tino. Tad has said exactly what I wanted to say. I'm so glad that you brought it up, Tad. Okay. Um, okay, so let's vote on it. Should we or anyone else has any comments or? So this one is consent to continue or consent to imp up implement, yeah? Plans implement. Sounds good. Plus one. Tina, Tad, Stephen, Zoe, Clint, Clint. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, Pamela. Everybody but Pamela. <laughs> <laughs> and new members not added to cohort channel, not invited to one-on-one -one session. This would be an issue. Uh, Pamela. Um, we, uh, we may have figured out a, a fix for this, but it's probably not being impl or, uh, utilized by all of the onboarding staff, but the problem was that once we decided to, as a, an onboarding team, to make attending an onboarding call be a prerequisite before joining the Slack, we realized we had a problem because we didn't know yet the names and handles of the people who we were meeting on the opening onboarding call, the group onboarding call. Um, so it was, we weren't able to find the people who attended that call to add them to the appropriate onboarding cohort channel and welcome them and offer to do a one-on-one -on -one with them from that point. Um, what we've been doing to fix that issue in the latest calls is when I do an onboarding and I, uh, I just ask people to raise their hands if they're not yet in the Slack and then I show them how to send a message to me and not to the whole group in case they're, they have privacy concerns. And then ask them to send me the email address that they will be submitting their application 
from, or, or maybe sometimes they've already submitted the application but haven't um, received an invite to the Slack. And then I also asked them to send me a, a likely handle, understanding that they don't know if that handle already exists, but at least something so that we can identify them when they do finally hit the introductions channel. We know who they are, that they've already attended an onboarding and can add them to the onboarding cohort channel that they um, joined with. Okay. Um, sorry, I just have, if, uh, Pamela, can you see my screen right now? Um, yep. Do you mind if you make this a separate issue and not as a comment, by the way, like so that we could tag it as by you know, consent? Or... Yeah, sure, I can do that. Thank you. So my stack would be, um, I just wanted to clarify as well, like we haven't really voted on the need, the requirement for people to, to be on the onboarding call. I think it was more on, we need to really encourage them to join and as much as possible, like build on new ways or more engaging ways for them to, to join the onboarding call before we add them. But it's not a prerequisite, right? So um, uh, right now there are higher chances or like, they have been more engaged in joining uh, onboarding calls than before because it's really inculcated in our messaging. But I don't think we have voted on making a prerequisite. So we're still adding folks from the pipeline. Oh, hey, Henry. Welcome. Um, anyone else want to comment before we start voting? No, Pamela, do you have comments? Nope, no more. Okay, so voting start. So this one is more on vote to continue, consent to continue, right? Yeah, because um, if we if we do consent to continue, the next step would be making sure that all of the people doing the onboarding facilitation. Um, are aware that they sh should ask these questions and get as many emails from people as possible so that we know who to look for when they do submit their application or we can send the Slack invite if they've already submitted their application. So it's more to add this to their process? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, before, uh, I've opened the vote, but Joe, go for it. Yeah, and I guess this is probably sort of tied to the comment that, I, or the um, item that I had above on uh, whatever that was that I didn't know. Uh, review, gather feedback, and update onboarding process. So Pamela, would uh, should this issue then be the issue for looking at the onboarding process, or would there be a separate one? Because um, I think ultimately it's just updating that onboarding process document, and then there are the GitHub, and then making sure that's consistently followed. Um, Joe, I, I think, yeah, updating the existing one would be optimal because that's where everybody goes for that information right now anyway. Okay. So it's more than updating the current process, but not, like, and this does not coincide with the current review process that Joe is working on the onboarding. Right. Okay. Um, so there's only three votes at the moment. Please vote now if you could. Tino, Jacob, Dad, and Henry, please feel free to vote as well. Yeah, so I should vote. I, I don't know if I had earned a vote. You're here. Um, we are, so just a, a background as well, like we are formalizing who, like who can, uh, the process or like the vote process of who gets to be part of this, but at the moment we don't have policy. So anyone who's in here is a free for Um And that's going to be part of the, the decision-making process that I'm working, like I'm typing, oh God, I'm, I'm, I'm building on it at the moment. Right, with Dino's request, we'll, we'll jump to tools and where is it? Tools and training. Um, allow Slack to connect Slack over IRC and XMPP. 
So um, give me just one second. My vacuum started up. Okay. <laughs> So, perfect timing. Uh, should it was, could you switch this to, to issues before we do anything? Could I switch this? Actually, I just invited the uh, uh, Kidograph who started this uh, to into the conversation. I don't know if she's going to be here, but I can switch it to issues. here. Oh, she made it. Um, Thank you. Hi. Okay. Okay, so yeah, if you could switch this over to the functions, that would be awesome. But cool. I'll start talking about it as well. Okay. okay. Do you want to talk about this or should I uh, just speak on your behalf? Go for right. it. Uh, so basically, the MIT team over there in uh, Cambridge is more comfortable with the open source uh, platform. As much as we use Slack, uh, a lot of people don't. Uh, IRC has a, or actually Slack has an IRC function or a feature rather uh, that they could use. It's pretty well protected. No one can log into your account or vice versa. And it just works. It's just the bottom line. Uh, they want to use open source uh, software such as Mirror or something uh, along those lines. They've been around for almost 20 years. And that's it. That's all they're really requesting. Um, okay. Anyone wants to comment on it? Dad. What server? Um, so uh, Slack actually uh, just enables a feature. There is no server needed. There's no middleman needed. But which IRC server? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, Slack has their own IRC server. It's all based on Slack. It's basically, uh, it's progcode.irc.slack.com. That's it. Okay. Um, Skip, do you want to say something about it? Uh, yeah, I just want to add that it's not just MIT related people who are very attached to IRC. There's a lot of um, people in the free software community. I mean, Freenode is how everyone has communicated forever, but it's much easier to add a new IRC server than it is to switch to Slack everywhere. <laughs> um, one question, though, like, I remember someone mentioned that this was, this would solve the archiving issue as well. Is that true? Uh, yeah. So this also makes archiving a lot easier um, because IRC, many, many IRC clients have archiving. So the easiest way once this is up continuously to archive as far as I can tell is I spin up a machine, I connect to the IRC their, um, port to the Slack and join with some whatever channels people want to archive. I can then log from there. And if you like, I don't know the best way to make those logs available, but I'd probably put it up on my public, just password protected or something similar. Okay. And in terms of, uh, sorry, uh, I'm gonna stack, uh, Joe. I just want to comment that is a pretty commonly felt pain point in the, uh, Community is something a lot of different people have requested, and assuming that it's a <clears throat> secure, which it seems to be, then I think it's a it's a good one. Okay, um, Jacob. I was just wondering if there is generally feature parity with being able to do file sharing and uh, like interact with Slack bots. Um, Kit or Kino. So you can communicate with the Slack bot. Uh, by the way, Kit, I can change your, your Git for some reason. Uh, either my Chrome is having issues or whatnot. If you can change it to functions, that'd be great. But you can communicate with Slack, but you can't do any file transfers. At least that's not permitted through Mirror. Maybe we can do it through some other uh, IRC app, but not what I observed. Okay. IRC doesn't support those functionalities, so this isn't going to affect anyone who's still on Slack, but since IRC doesn't have those functionalities, it would be very hard to implement that. But I do want to point out, if you do upload something into Slack and you want to share with the community, what ends up happening is that uh, Slack sends a link instead of a, like a small preview window. Okay, and um, 
in so is this connected with uh with with the app ad channel call will this affect the ad channels or it wouldn't or it will keep it up um if you if you disable it slack disables it across the board so it follows through okay um stephen i'm sorry i i, I missed you that's okay um so this, as I understand it, this is just another means of being able to access our Slack. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And then from a standpoint of um, security, Joe actually already addressed uh, the question I had, but then I had another one. Uh, when, um, Kit, when you mentioned um, archiving, and does that just give, gives you the ability to um, access archived um, information, or does this give um, the ability to offload uh, archived information to uh, to another source? I could answer that. If Kit uh, Kit did mention oh, that. That's great. Kit, okay. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Um, so. This just makes it easier for someone to personally archive. This doesn't, like by itself, doesn't deal with the archiving. Once it's set up, I can deal with the archiving. Um, just by, like, IRC has very many text-based clients, which make it a lot easier to save what's happened and make that available. And also, you can't access the archive until you log in, and you can't log in without a account within our Slack. Yeah. I'm just wondering if that creates a security issue for us that this gives. I mean, do we all have the ability to archive information yes. from, from Slack? So this doesn't yeah. give any additional permissions or anything like that. Yep. Okay. No. Um, Henry. Yeah, two questions. So not knowing anything about IRC, I, my questions are, one, is anyone being able to, and Stephen maybe was getting towards this, is anyone, is the ability for anyone to be able to archive a security issue? Was that what you were wondering, Stephen? And then also um, the other question I have is that, are there benefits to looking at Joe's cartoon to getting people to switch into Slack in terms of shared terminology um, that uh, that we have by using the same platform? Um, I, I don't think there is a, a, a great deal of benefit switching on to Slack. I've been using uh, IRC ever since like 1996-ish. There isn't a big benefit. It's just that IRC has a lot of software that you can download either on Linux or either and even on simpler uh, terminals. Uh, and the only big benefit of having Slack is just it looking pretty, and that's it. Uh, in terms of logs, in terms of uh, keeping a uh, archive, every RSC uh, app, or at least the ones I've used in the last 10, 20 years, uh, they just keep a log. That's it. That's all it is. If you choose not to keep a log, you have to go manually turn it off. Is it a security issue? Well. I've been on a whole bunch of IRCs and nobody has ever told me it's a security issue to log there or our chats. Basically, if I'm on the chat, I'm, I'm speaking as well. So, I don't um, it's a security issue. Uh, I would also add then to that, like with regards to what Joe was saying uh, or the cartoon that he said, which was a classic uh, XKCD cartoon. Um, it, having the IRC for me, like adds on to the, the 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 goals that we have wherein people will engage however they want to engage and in terms of this like people will communicate with frog code the way that people want to communicate with them so i think the the more avenues we provide to folks the better and if this seamlessly and securely provides that kind of access to them i think i'm all for it. any more comments or Sweet. Okay, so we'll now call for a vote. Um, consent to implement this one, right? Kit, Antino? Yeah? Sorry, what? This is, we're, we're now voting on it to consent to implement. Hey, can I ask a process question, Rappi? Go for it. Um, so, I don't I don't think this is a situation when I would want to, but I'm wondering whether 
you someone could ever uh, vote to like push a decision down the road until we learn more. Um, I don't think this is a situation. I was just thought, okay, maybe is there anything more I would ask other people? Um, yeah. I don't think that's that situation. I'm just wondering. I know I missed the decision making group that I wish I'd come to. I just, that, you you I could mean. so so this is more of a so when you do consent, you could uh, it's it's more a consent to continue or implement, right? And then there's one more thing we're in. If you don't feel that it has the it you can consent to it, the minus one or the down vote is essentially for us to continue to iterate on it. So iteration means like either providing more info or changing the language or changing how we implement it. So so as so the goal is for everyone to to upvote it or to vote yes on it. And and it's not when you say downvote, it's not like rejecting it, but rather to iterate on it or to table it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so so we're going at this in a very iterative decision making process. Great. Um, Tino, so so I, I I'm saying it's a consent to implement, right? It is a consent to implement, and I believe Kit is also consenting. Uh, I'm not too sure. Hey, I consent. Do. Sorry. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so. We'll continue on. Now. Thank you so much, Kit. This is an awesome initiative, and thank you for doing this. You're welcome. I'm sorry, I'm not good at those things. <laughs> no. um, do we have any more greens? Preston left forum, or um, Joe? Do you want to to move to to Dave on this one, or no? Yeah, I don't. I don't. Unless Pamela or Stephen have contacts on this one, I unfortunately do not have much. Okay, Pam, Stephen? I have nothing uh, to add. Okay. Same here. Sweet. Um, so we can start on the usual one. So my first is the, the for, on the evangelism side. We only have 30 or 20 more minutes left. Uh, sorry, 20 minutes left. So I'm pushing to, to ask for the consent for us to, ha to make progressive hack night in New York. Sorry, Progressive Hack Night NYC to be a separate entity from Prog Code. So right now, Prog Code is the one hosting it. If this is consented, we are going to create essentially a separate entity from Prog Code. This provides it more sustainability and tenability, and this is totally independent from what Prog Code is doing. But in a way, like as as any other project, Prog Code will be the framework of support to it. It's just that the leadership will be different. Um, I think. We are forming, or we are planning on forming after this consent. Uh, uh, what's this? Uh, a steering committee, which will meet hopefully this week. And um, so, in terms of governance, it's just going to be a separate project now, just like any other projects we have in Prog Code. Um, and so, what's going to be effective is the evangelism, because essentially we are going. This is going to be a separate entity. So they will have their own norms, their own cultures, their own policies, and their own decision-making process. So um, is that cool? Is that any other comments for it? Um, so Jacob, do you want to ask now or like this isn't connected to it? It's going to be offline, right? This is separate. I just want to raise it. Okay. If you can um, scroll up to operations if, if we're moving on. Scroll to operate later. Oh, sorry. Where is it? Bottom of operations. Yeah. Um, just a concern that we kind of discussed a little bit uh, offline was needing to be able to limit liability for actions that our members are taking. If, um, for example, members are going and promoting um, uh, for-profit organizations within our Slack, um, unbeknownst to us, that could get us into, into trouble. Um, so figuring out maybe through a uh, user agreement for being in the Slack, uh, or just talking to some lawyers and figuring figuring out if we actually could be held culpable. Do you mind finishing this off first because it's um, we've started in the evangelism and then we'll just jump back. Down. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't realize you were not done. 
Okay, so um, stack question for Joe. Uh, yeah, just um, is this intended to be in scope for a um, national and, and other um, <clears throat> other chains or other locations for this as well as one big <clears throat> separate entity that's an umbrella or will each local area be their own thing? Um, I feel that right now from what we're seeing is that it's going to be a sep like it will be its own thing. But it, again, since we are a progressive coders network, right? Like the, the networks of which will be, like the collaboration network, we will be providing space. We being frog code, providing space for collaboration with these separate half nights. But, um, but just having that kind of uh, separation or like independence from what frog code is. Because right now people are perceiving progressive hack night as a frog code project, as a frog code, uh, frog code ownership. But what we're going to do is, Separate it completely, creating separate labeling, different um, different entity, different uh, different messaging, all of that. So if, if it were to become a legal entity, it would be separate from the other um, Henry. So I, I'm just I'm always playing devil's advocate in my mind and thinking about benefits of keeping it together um, might be. Um, one, it, it's kind of forcing us to, it could potentially, y'all know more about structure than me, but it could force us to uh, start going towards this umbrella like formation that I think people in this community want to go to. So keeping it affiliated, uh, I think that even if it's becoming a separate entity, so in the scenario, it is a separate entity, keeping that, um, networking relationship or defining the relationship in some way that is um, beneficial to both groups um, makes sense to me and I'm wondering I don't know sorry I didn't read enough and I'm coming no yeah I think that so even if it's a, it, it it essentially will act as if it's another application partner right so right now we are providing that much support to the other to phone your rep to other entities as well so the relationship would be much more of a support network rather than an ownership relationship. So it just removes the responsibilities and actions from Frog Code and then let Progressive Hack Night have their own set of ownership sets, to, which makes it much more stronger and tenable, I think, because it's much more decentralized. Um, Stephen. Frog Code is always free to sponsor any of the hack nights that might uh, be happening, you know, anywhere in the country, actually, or anywhere in the world, if uh, if we want. And uh, one thing we might think about is, as um, some of our leadership is traveling around and uh, showing up at some of these events, that uh, maybe we coordinate um, the uh, the sponsorship of a hack night here or there. So, for instance, if like like we were in Chicago. And clearly, they've got their own structure. They've uh, they've had it for some time. Um, we could, uh, if if we have the funds and feel like it's uh, a good evangelism thing to do, um, sponsor a hack night where we you know, provide the food that night or um, make a presentation, things like that. I think that's a great idea. I think we would add this like frog code is free to sponsor, and we could stand in as a sponsor for these hack nights. Um, Anyone else? No? Okay, so I'm going to start consent to implement. That's one for me. Anyone else? I consent, I'm just trying to find it, sorry. It's in evangelism, um, help post out. Got it. Yay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. Um, I'll continue on. Queer Tech NYC. This is going to be very quick. Um, I was asked to speak at a Queer Tech NYC to talk about uh, Pro Code, to talk about different projects like National Voter File. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm also thinking about talking about other projects outside and inside and, and in a way recruit people to work on these open source projects. So um, 
it's essentially it's a very quick uh, and also find more allies from from the queer uh, sector and um, yeah I'm just going to talk about how my husband has been influencing me and in, in working on more progressive actions and technology any questions about that no okay um, Quick vote to continue. Thank you. And to continue. So another one for for evangelism. Um, Rice Chicago, which is this huge organization in Chicago, um, invited me to speak in their General Assembly um, on October 23, 24. Um, this is going to include all the other um, movement leaders in the progressive area side. Um, they are also trying to get other uh, projects. I'm trying to facilitate if they could get as much as, as many progressive quilters. Um, projects involved, so I'm talking to Ben Galuski uh, to, to, to talk about National Voter File. I'm trying to talk to, uh, I'm bringing in as many folks from our community as possible. So um, uh, hopefully by then I, I'll be sending in more names into the mix. Uh, for, to, so I'm connecting with Genevieve Pierce. It's the, it's the, um, the founder of Rice Chicago. So um, I'm just asking for a consent to continue and go there. Yep. Um, so I've opened it up now. Anyone who wants to do? Okay. Thank you for the link, Jacob. I'm going to post it here. Okay. So, Dino. If anyone's going to go to that event in New York, let me know. I'm definitely going to attend in Queer Tech NYC, March 28th? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm looking for more. Who said, oh, okay, is this you, Joe? Update volunteer registration form? We have 10 minutes. Yep. Um, and so, fam, I don't know if this should be lumped into the other conversations on volunteer registration. Um, but I thought it'd be useful to update the subtext to um, understand, to, to reframe the, uh, the goals that we have, nonpartisan, non-hierarchical, working to get money out of politics, and also be a bit more leading in um, how they would actually support these goals and just getting back to the core, the core issues that we're going after. Um, and then the other ones are just um, minimizing some of the things like the phone number and, and others that I don't necessarily think we need or utilize um, and also just changing e dash mail to email. Um, this is one of like, so a bit of background and transparency on this. I, is it like we were having a discussion about the resistance language, right? This is about it. And, um, we would like to to more focus on a uh, more oh shit I'm sorry I forgot um, uh, Jacob sorry I'll, I'll go for it afterwards so this is more about just bringing home the main mission and vision of Plato which is to remove the influence of money in politics through open source is that right is, is yep that, okay oh so bring the message for okay so Henry. Yeah, so I heard remove asking for a phone number. I think just from all my organizing experience, getting people's phone numbers is great. We don't know what the tech landscape is going to be like. Um, and maybe being able to text people one day might be very valuable, important. Um, so I would say, unless there's strong reason to take it out, um, we shouldn't. And then um, I guess, a, like a compromise would be making it optional, but I would say, if possible, make it make it. Yeah. It is optional. Yeah, it's optional, but I'm not strongly tied to it, so I can read that. Um, 
we so we should keep it. Uh, bring the message further in removing influence of money politics. Anyone else? I'd really recommend against making phone numbers necessary. That's going to allow a lot more surveillance of any group or make people feel a lot more vulnerable putting themselves out there if they're from any group that is worried about being surveilled. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and it's currently optional, so it'll stay that way. Thank you, um, Pino. Uh, I've been wondering if there's going to be any discussion or any uh, kind of formation around security. So this way, if we are collecting information on uh, our volunteers, where does it live? How many layers do we have before someone can access it? Uh, I think that's super important, especially for uh, us onboarding people. We don't know who has this, uh, who knows this information, and it, it's essential for us to keep it private. So right now it's me, uh, it's really the, the most active at the moment, like me, um, me, <laughs> no. um, Joe, Pamela, and C. Uh, and C. So we're the ones who are vetting people at the moment. Um, but that's going to be more formalized once we start the board, I think. So like the process by which I'm still form I'm, I'm writing about that. Um, any more comments? No? Okay, um, I'm going to put it up for a vote now. This is vote to continue, right? The consent to continue. Joe? Uh, it should be implement if it's just changing the subtext. Okay, content, consent to implement. Um, but I'd be happy to make uh, grammatical or whatever other changes if people have them. Sounds good. So the, the issues is, just to recap, uh, we should make we should not make phone numbers necessary, but it's good that we're collecting them for, for those who volunteer that information. Okay, so Jacob wants to revisit it before deploying. Yeah, and just um, the uh, issue over there, Jacob, is probably the best place if you have any recommended changes to the, to the copy. So this would be... Gotcha. Once we do this, we have to consent to deploy as well, no? Yeah. This is so beautiful. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to consent by deploy. I'll just comment it. So once you're ready to deploy, create a new issue. Once ready to deploy, create issue. Okay, so... Um, we're going now down to Jacob with the limiting liability for action. Uh, there is one more quick one that I wanted to, that, that I had up there. The update staff change in decision making. Okay. Um, so right after update volunteer registration form is the update staff change and decision making process. Um, I'm going to click it on now and if you could. Oh. Um, I have an issue for created. You? I, I linked to the wrong thing. I have an issue created too. But anyway, so we have the, <coughs> I'll update that, but we have the um, existing um, existing change in decision making. It was in, intentionally very limited in what was actually in, included. Um, I wanted to start just a brainstorming conversation around what this actually looks like. I pulled in some of the conversation that we had uh, last week on things like Pamela brought up earlier of, um, of, um, making sure that we are notifying people and what that actually looks like. Um, and so I think there's another one I just want, would like to get people's um, uh, just input into this issue and document and use this as a place that maybe in a, in a couple of weeks we can come back and look at how does the change or decision-making uh, process actually um, update to reflect what we're doing here. So I'm going to start, and this is something that I've already been doing. Right? Which one? Like this decision making process. So we're we're doing that right now. And in terms of the consent process, like that's something that I'm I'm writing at the moment. Is that oh. well, where is it? Oh, um it's in my head. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean so I wanted to get it down and follow the uh decision making process. Um but it's based on what we've been talking about. So ideally we could just use this issue and, and update accordingly. So this would be the consent, the, the consent making process. Yeah. Yeah. And 
one question I have is whether change and decision making are separate things or if it can just be one and the same. But I, so the document that I started there is just brainstorming this stuff out. Change and decision making. Okay. Seems like they should be the same thing. So who's this? That was Henry. I just said I think they should probably be the same. Okay. Yeah, I'm kind of leaning toward that. Um, there was one thing about um, about when uh, when there was just a, a minimal change or addition to to the toolkit, right? So is that something that is like this or? Yeah, I put that in there too of uh, what standard changes look like and how those are defined and what we need to do for that. So that's uh, captured as well. Okay. Um, so we'll put it to a vote then. Um, this is more to consent to continue, right? Just to continue, yeah. Um, this is to consent to continue the discussion if we're going. I, 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 I'm going. So all the things that I'm writing right now, I'll just post there. Yeah, please. Yeah, I just wanted to gather some central momentum around it. Okay. I also suggest uh, updating, changing the title of the GitHub issue to document instead of update if we don't already have any documentation. It is, uh, um, we have a uh, current change of decision making that's, that's uh, currently documented. I see, cool. Okay. Thank you. Um, if you haven't voted yet, please go on clicking on the title and, and the consent vote is there. Um, and Jacob, we will be moving to limiting load. Have you created a, an issue for this, Jacob? Uh, no, this was, I kind of just wanted to surface it here and then uh, follow up with Stephen. Uh, I'm, I'm sure he's probably thought about this some, but just curious what his thoughts are. Okay, so this is this is no no consent or whatever. You just wanted to raise this one, right? I think uh, we might want to come up with a plan and then consent to following that. Um, have you checked the documentation from this Thursday? Oh, you were there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this is connected to the meeting last Thursday, right? Uh, yes, a little bit. Stephen, do you have um, Henry? Do you want do you want to comment the one the thing that you wanted to comment a while ago? Yeah, I I wanted to. I don't. I should, before I say too much, I should go back and read the current um, how we're incorporated is it as a nonprofit or profit. But from my limited knowledge of the subject, I've heard that actually being incorporated as a business can be very can get you out of a lot of legal trouble down the road. So I'm wondering, do we ever consider that or but there are reasons not to. Yeah, um, I'm going to post the link from that meeting. Um, would really encourage you to check this out. Um, Great, this thanks. Um, we are forming as a 501c4, so it's a not-for-profit. And the one main issue that we have right now is how to interface with um, with, with LLCs, but we're, we're working on it at the moment. Um, the general action of the membership, the main strategy we have at the moment is to really Right now, the network, as we've seen, like Progressive Coder Network as an entity is seen as the network whole, right? So what we're trying to strategize right now is to push the, the scope of the network, of Prog Code as an entity down to Prog Code volunteer staff. So much so that we, since we have already provided that space for, for the network to thrive, um, we can rely on all those relationships already to thrive on itself without the liabilities being put on good entity. Um, so, Stephen, do you have anything to add on to this? Uh, yeah, just to uh, to answer Henry's concern, uh, we we are currently incorporated as a nonprofit. Uh, we don't have tax exempt status, but we do have the protection of being a corporation. Uh, it's the same for nonprofits as it is for for profits. Uh, from a standpoint of insulating members and staff from liability. There are a number of, uh, of issues we have to address in the, uh, that are raised in the law 
and um, and to uh, to respond to uh, your your comment earlier, Jacob. Yeah, we we did uh, have some some early discussions about it, uh, but we haven't uh, we haven't gone back to them yet. But uh, you and I should uh, should sit down talk about that and strategize some different things that we can do. I mean, I, I shouldn't say just the two of us. I mean, anybody who wants to join in should uh, absolutely uh, take, uh, take part in it. But there are a lot of uh, potential um, ways that people can get around the, uh, the corporate liability insulation. And those are things that I'd like to be able to address in, uh, in a group discussion. So, okay, um, could you, or Jacob and Stephen, could you outline a, a discussion agenda and like all the all the risks that we need to mitigate, if ever? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so and we can schedule something inside the operations channel. Yeah. Sure. For next week. Sounds good. Mitigate the list and mitigate issues. Okay. Um, Oh wow, we're so productive today, everyone. Um, I'll skip this because we're we're at the end of our time. I just wanted to to ask for all of you because, um, so I'm I'm a, I'm all for transparency, and since um, I'm somewhat perceived as the lead, someone leading this group, I need to be transparent about um, this talk I had with ACLU. They're offering to compensate me with a, um, okay, so. Uh, I, so down to the transparency area, I'm skipping the, the strategic partnerships and leaving this for next week as well. Um, for the transparency area, there's this portion there where Rappi is asking if he can accept the compensation offered by ACLU to him for the service rendered on the people power map. So I built the people power map, this one through um, and some conversation. Oh shit, this is so nice. Um, I built this for the uh, for ACLU, and they're offering me offering compensation for it. It was used for the distributed organizing team, and um, essentially, I think I, I haven't updated this yet, but I'm going to update this once I have clear version. Um, <laughs> ego check. I, I it was a very objective ob objective observation. Jesus. Um, and they, they would like to compensate me for that because they could. And right now, I'm on the red <laughs> from all the other expenses. But um, uh, I wanted to ask if it's kosher with everyone for me to continue on this. So I'm asking this not because I'm for reporting all the, um, all the uh, freelance gigs that everyone does, but it's just a special case for me since I founded Prodcode and I... I'm I'm leading currently leading this organization. So um any comments? Any anything you might want to ask me about it? Um I, I think I was I was reading some IRS guidelines on the drive back uh home today and I just wanted to be sure we keep any compensation for leaders of our group within um, the except like usual market rates, which I'm I'm sure this is, but I actually don't know for. the market rate. I I actually tried to push down on the rates that I put away to them, but um, I'll check out the market rate. The market rate, Henry. Congrats, Rappy. Nice job. You deserve it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anyone else? And more. <laughs> okay. Um, so what will happen is if I continue on this, I'll start the conversation with Kenneth on getting that in. Um, another, so if you could please, um, uh, I'm going to vote here as well. Another is the recent expenses for prog code. I just wanted to be transparent as well that a lot of these things are currently um, out of pocket on my end. And um, since we are, a not, we've started becoming a not for profit, um, I just wanted to report all the expenses that I've been um, having. So 
most of them are from flights and and hotel stays in in the places I've talked to for, about broad code I've evangelized and um there I haven't included the chicken wings I've eaten in here so so I, I'll take it on my own um but the uh yeah anyone wants to comment on this or anyone has issues on me going for this or just listening to this down because um, I was advised that if we're going through this, uh, we have to to list down on it once we do the reimbursement. So I'm just listing it all down as we move forward. And this week, I think I will be doing another expense addition because I will be going to the Democracy Alliance conference. Um, comments? Sounds good. I don't have a com uh, uh, some accounting software. Okay. At least, uh, or maybe something like Expensify for keeping track of receipts and reimbursements. And if, okay, of receipts and numbers. You should keep yeah. track of your receipts though. Okay. Yeah, it's it's love the transparency and awesome that ACLU is paying you. It might also be a uh, a good thing even to get a dedicated credit card and just put any related expenses on that. I think um, Stephen, do we have a dedicated credit? Can we do that now or not yet? Sorry, too many windows open. Um, we can. Uh, we can technically open a bank account, um, which is what you probably need to be able to have a, uh, a credit card linked to. Um, we would have to get an EIN, which we have held off doing until we can get our um, bylaws and our, um, uh, our uh, tax-exempt application done. But, but yeah, we could do that. We could do it now, and, um, and that would be fine. Okay. Uh, the problem is you, you need to put money into a bank account. And so the question is, where does the money come from to put into the bank account? So that's why, you know, again, kind of the cart before the horse thing, but I, I think it's a great idea and it's, it is a, um, a good way to keep track of expenses um, to, uh, to use a company credit card. Sounds good. It's getting real, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is real. <laughs> it is real, everyone. Um, okay, so any last words before we end? We, it's now 4.30, so we can end this now. Uh, oh, sorry. Please vote for your consent to continue with the recent expense. Um, we will be looking for accounting. Um, so here, if anyone could just add in your consent. Thank you. So this is continuous practice of our active updating. And I think that this has been proven really effective in terms of checking a lot of boxes, right? Like getting buy-in, keeping people engaged, having or removing or avoiding collision, and just having everyone in the know of what's happening. So um, I think this is such a great, for me personally, I think it's a great process that we've been doing. Let me know if we can still improve it I'm really open to that. And I think this is a, uh, go for it, Kenny. Yeah, so I talked to Joe about processing. This process, my first op operations call in maybe a long time, if uh, ever, I loved it. It feels very good. I want to come back. Um, but one thing that I think is something to keep in the back of our minds is that processes that make us kind of go forward and do things and I think the whole culture of prog code kind of envelops this, it, it have the concern of not keeping us focused on one mission. It can kind of, we can kind of just do things that feel good and we feel good. So I think that can come out of conflict, intention and collision. So I think um, it's kind of a sign when we don't have any of that, the worry might be that we lose our, our missional focus. Okay. Um, that's, that's a valid comment. And uh, thank you for that. 
um, we will keep in uh, like we will definitely keep our heads straight in terms of um, uh, in terms of having focus and right now I just wanted to like anyone else wants last comment before I finally comment <laughs> um, Jacob yeah um, one one other thing that I think might be really helpful in addition to taking notes like we are right now is to uh, create a checklist for a given meeting for action items that come out of it, uh, like Stephen and I setting up a meeting for next week, because uh, I tend to forget things that happened an hour and a half ago after talking. Yeah, yeah I think it's been stuff. I think that's going to be awesome. Like uh, I'm going to say because we have listed like consent to continue, consent to implement, and like I think uh, one of the things I'll be sending is the action points from the meeting because we have. So after this, we usually create a post for report and all that, but this is definitely going to, to be set. Okay. Um, so just wanted, before we end, I just wanted to say thank you. And one of the main things that we're working on, uh, like remember our winter strategy. Our winter strategy was before we entered winter 2017, <laughs> We were very chaotic in terms of communication lines, in terms of decision-making process, in terms of that. And I think we're right on the money in providing a very sustainable, tenable, and effective way of communicating and keeping each other in our causes. And, and I think that we're in line to accomplish what we have set for in our strategy for winter. Um, Jacob and I have been, like, it's really awesome how he has been here for quite a while and we have been really been at it in terms of, of strategizing. We've been up all night late um, on our strategy for spring. And I think um, it's it would really benefit us all. Uh, I will be presenting, I, he would be presenting his strategy. I think this is where different focus is is forming. Um, we have, and I'm, 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 what I'm doing right now, I'm setting the stage for spring 2017. Um, because I think we are in line of accomplishing the winter 2017 strategy 2000, uh, and spring 2017 is going to be much more pointed in focus because, uh, and, and I totally agree with Henry, like, because we now have a good sustainable communication line and kudos to everyone who's been here, like helping tirelessly to push it. I think uh, Anna's not here, but I really give credit to Anna for driving a lot of this effort in terms of really whipping us into action. Um, and also Dave for keeping that focus in line. Uh, I think that for spring, I'm really excited for, for Jacob to present his strategy and for him and Joe to start talking to each other because like, I think there's a lot of really awesome because, uh, and also on my end, we can really make this a more sustainable driving force for progressive change now that we have set a good communication line. So again, kudos and thank you so much for being here. And um, yeah, anyone wants to have last, last words, please feel free, but we have two minutes. I'm gonna stop sharing. Great meeting.